safetyfm.com with Jay Allen. Changing safety cultures, one broadcast and one podcast at a time. Welcome to Safety FM, where we talk about safety that's truly inspired by you. This episode of the broadcast and the podcast has been brought to you by Safety Focus Moment. They are consultants that want to get you to the safety culture that you've been looking for. For more information, go to safetyfocusmoment.com. Well, hello and welcome back and thank you for coming to the show. It's been an interesting few weeks in regards to the last few episodes that have been going on. I want to say thank you. Thank you one million times. And that's not a joke. As I say that is because we have had a total of 1 million listens and downloads over the last few months that we've been doing the podcast. So I've been super surprised, I guess will be the word. A lot more listeners than what I ever expected, especially starting off down this path. So just wanted to say thank you on that. So before we go too far, did you get a chance to listen to Todd Coughlin's pre-accident investigation podcast? If you didn't, Go take a listen to that one, especially it's episode 184. Now, what he did was pretty smooth. We had a brief conversation in regards of him recording the podcast that we recorded for Safety FM, and he played it from his point of view. So it's the whole recording, and you'll hear kind of the better microphone audio from him doing the recording, and you'll hear me being on the phone. What he referred to it as is cooking the sausage. So if you haven't had an opportunity to take a listen to it, go to the pre-accident investigation podcast hosted by Dr. Todd Coughlin and take a listen to it. It's definitely a different approach on how the podcast was done. I listened to it over the weekend, had a pretty good time listening to it. Now, always keep in mind that some of these are a little bit behind in regards of um, when they're released to when they are actually recorded. So right now, give or take, we're probably within the first, first to second week of August. So that's why you're hearing this in a little bit of a delay. But if you do get an opportunity, go take a listen to it at the Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast. And I want to thank Dr. Conklin for giving us the opportunity to be on his podcast and him being on our podcast here at Safety FM. So thank you for going out of your way and doing that. I I really do appreciate it. On today's episode, it is a different approach. It's a different conversation. It is definitely something that I think that we don't talk about a lot. It's something we really need to consider having in our conversation. And this is a conversation about fatigue. Today, we have a conversation with Joe Ballas from Human Factor Safety, and he can be found at humanfactorsafety.com. So as we talk to Mr. Ballas today, you will listen to his approach when it comes to employee fatigue and how it can affect your organization. Enjoy the interview with Joe Ballas here on Safety FM. I have your website up, and so I'm going to address that a couple times in here, so I just want to to make sure if there was anything in particular you wanted me to to point out on on your website. No, the only thing is that uh, what I was going to point out was that uh, Human Factor Safety, the the company that I really have, is uh, more than just fatigue, and, and I started out, uh, Jay, with 12 different topics when I, I, I formed last July. And uh, I didn't know what was really going to start to take off. And as I started talking to more business people and so on and so forth, they said, don't limit yourself, but, but don't uh, pigeonhole yourself as well. And so I've, I've, I've pulled it down to about six topics now, which are well within range. So there's a little bit more space for me to move into, but my premier service, I've been doing fatigue for a long time, for like 12 years. And so I thought that would be the the most uh, uh, available as well as uh, applicable to any industry. It doesn't matter whether it's healthcare, construction, emergency services, logistics, manufacturing, transportation, it doesn't really matter. And my my whole goal is, is, is to do prevention. That's my whole goal. So let me ask you, how did you start getting involved in safety? What was what was the moment that you said, okay, this is what I want to do? How did it come about? Well, I, I joined the Air Force. After I, I got out of the Navy as a hospital corpsman, I went to, 
to Rutgers University in New Jersey, got an undergraduate in biology. But I've always been a conscientious individual. And so when I went to the Air Force, the Air Force taught me a lot about prevention because the, uh, the opportunity to get hurt inside the Air Force, because they're self-employed, they, can, they, they're, they have their own self-insurance, they can do whatever they want. But risk really became uh, an issue for me. And so in the field that I was in, I was an aerospace physiologist. That sounds more uh, elaborate and you know uh, uh, uppity than w really what it is. But really what it was aviation safety. And what we were trying to do was trying to, all the things that Air Force, all jets or anything that flew in the Air Force, as well as people who jumped out of aircraft was under our purview. And so we would do training in all of those areas in regards to prevention of mishaps or accidents. And there's a difference, there's a legal term there, but we won't get into that. But the point is, is that I did that for 12 years in regards to prevention, to prevent accidents. And so after I got out, what, what, what do I do with all that? What do I do with my medical history? What do I do with my safety history? And so I started pursuing more jobs in the safety area. And so I worked for a contractor. I worked, actually, if you know what system safety is, I, I was a system safety engineer for about five years, as well as a human factors engineer for about the same, for about five years. And I worked OSHA for about five years. And so that's my whole background. So it's kind of a gamish. It's, it's eclectic. It's, uh, it's uh, a matrix of things. But I, I really like the prevention aspect of things. So you, you you reference a lot inside inside of that particular answer. So when you start looking into human factors in particular, how do you deem that behavior based safety is not kind of the way to go and really start applying to the human factor aspect of the of the whole thing? Well, there's a difference between I think there's a fine line between behavioral safety and human factors. Human factors borders more on the outcome of what the uh, performance is going to look like, and there's a to me, in my experience, there's been a little bit of the more of the uh, uh, behavioral aspects in it. So it's not full psychology. And, that, and that's the way I think it's a differentiation point. There's, an oper there's a huge operational component to human factors. Huge oper uh, operational component. And that has to do with how does the, the person interface with whatever you're doing. So I have done software uh, of how it interfaces with the human. I've done screen uh, uh, layouts for people. I have done station reworks for people. I have also designed boxes for carrying over long distances for people, for, for contractors and for employers. So it, that's the human performance aspect. How do we make it so the human can perform to their greatest capability rather than behavioral-based safety, which is focusing on more of I guess, behaviors, and it seems a little bit more ethereal, maybe to some folks, others not. And I always like to ask that question because I know that depending on the timeline, if you start talking about human organizational performance or human factors, as we're calling it here, and you say, hey, this is the better way of doing it, opposed to behavior-based safety, depending on where you're at in your journey and point in time, people might look at you as you're crazy. And I'm not saying that to be mean, but it's just one of those things where it comes about where we're going, well, this is what's worked so far. So how are you all of a sudden looking at the new point of view on safety and how does this work in comparison? I, I understand that. Uh, I think uh, uh, behavioral safety is more understood and probably more uh, accepted uh, because there's not there's not a lot of safety folks that work in the system safety or in the human factors community that are in safety, and that's the reason why it is um, different and difficult do this job and I, I, would, I would agree with you wholeheartedly there but but to me i'm focusing on human performance so I, there, I would just say it's an operational component and i'm glad that you worded it exactly the way that you just did because that's a lot of the times of what we look at or people tend to forget is that we have psychologists psychiatrists or doctors that come in and they're really pushing towards the behavior-based safety. And I'm not saying one's wrong or one's better than the other, or one's incorrect. But if you have, I would rather you have something than have nothing. So that I want to make sure that that's very clear. But it's one of those things that sometimes when you give some of these theories or what has worked in certain organizations per se, they don't want to hear it because they're basing it more of a, well, I look at the behavior and the psychology side of it. So I'm glad that you actually expanded so much into that. 
So as you're going in through this and you start looking into these different aspects with these different with these different companies that you look into, and then also now you're doing the human factor factor aspect of it. How do you de- how do you start going? Okay, this sleep debt thing is becoming a huge issue, and how all of a sudden do you get turned on to? Hey, this is what I need to focus on now. Okay. Uh- what I did is, is I actually, I retired from the Air Force in 2004, and I actually tried to start this, this company in 2004, and I gave it about a three-month trial, three trial run, and I talked to a lot of people at that point in time. Unfortunately, the economy was so down uh, that no one had any money, but they loved the material. They absolutely loved the material, and they were hungry for that, especially on the employee level. The management, uh, they were kind of lukewarm, and they're 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 counting their you know they're counting their money and they're counting their pennies, and I I understand that, uh, and so I thought this would probably be re- resurrect this again because I think uh, there's a lot of information that's out there. So for instance, if we can, uh, there's a financial there's a there, first of all there's a historical aspect to fatigue. There's a financial impact to fatigue. There is a work related injury stats impact to fatigue. And it's also the current state of OSHA to fatigue. And that's the reason why I'm trying to bring this into the mainstream, actually to elevate it to the point where they look at it like ergonomics. When you go into a company and you start talking about this and you and they're telling you, you know, what is this? How do we look at this from a return on investment standpoint? How do you what are those conversations? How do those conversations go? Well, first of all, I've never had a conversation like that. Oh, good. That's great. That's great. That's really good to hear. I, I cannot. I cannot. I cannot get a conversation with an executive, with an operations manager, with a CFO, with a CEO. I cannot get it because I've been uh, stiff armed by a lot of people. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, then, I, then it's not good. Then, okay, not good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Then I thought you meant more along the lines that when you get to that particular point that you're in there, where they turn around, they just tell you, "Yeah, we notice that it's a factor," and all of a sudden they go, "Okay, let's have the conversation." So, what? So, I guess what are they? What are they opposing? But, but Jay, I still have the numbers. I have numbers that they may not agree to the numbers. So, if you go to the National Safety Council, what you can do is, and what I would tell anybody on the podcast or you, I would say, okay, construction costs uh, $1.8 million per year they spend on fatigue-related types of things. Okay, so what are those kinds of things? Well, their workman comp insurance rates, their healthcare premiums, their employee replacement, their overtime, their absenteeism, their presenteeism, and those have dollar amounts associated with them. Now, they may not agree to that. They may say, well, your numbers are way off. That's okay, but they have the numbers. They have the numbers. So at least we have a, a, a time to say, okay, we, we may disagree on money, but the idea that the factors still exist and they still track those by numbers is still what's important. So to me, the insurance agencies, which I would love to get into, but I don't think they're going to, I mean, that would be the, that's the crown jewel. The insurance companies offering this program for fatigue or to have it part of their, their portfolio would be great. The next one is employers, and then down the line. Then it goes to safety, and then down the line. That's the way. I, that's what I've discovered. So I would imagine at this point, you've done a lot of research then in regards of how the ergonomics piece actually was able to get into, I guess, more of like the business aspect. Or is that kind of where you, when you start looking into trying to implement this, is that kind of the same path that you want to go down? Or did you see a lot of the struggles that they've actually went about in regards of trying to get this in? Well, I know ergonomics was passed by uh, President Bill Clinton back, I think, in 1995, and the employers and industries rebelled against it because it was actually codified, and they, they felt that they could not actually, uh, uh, what's the best way, implement it because it would drive them out of business because they were, practicing, they were, they were having so many claims or they thought they were hamstrung. But it backed off from there, and you can still do that. You can still report uh, MSD injuries through OSHA systems. But you cannot find that on the Bureau of Labor and Statistics if I type in fatigue. You're not going to find it. So the best thing I could do right now, my, my best selling point would be to make it a best practice. It's a best industry practice. As a matter of fact, it, fatigue is not codified anywhere including in dangerous areas where you're talking about offshore drilling rigs or 
type line things, but some of them, those people, do have a fatigue risk management system that is used as a best practice. And so when you start looking into that and they have the system set up for best practice, what do you look at in regards of, let's say, for instance, sleep? So what is the amount of time that they're off from one shift to another? Is that incorporated into this best practice or how does that exactly work? Well, I can't, um, I can't, I, I can't have access to their data. Okay. All I have is I have scientific data that shows me uh, what the quality of sleep is, what industries and what areas uh, that are uh, are short, what they call short sleepers, less than seven hours of sleep per night, and that all of it is. Jay, there's a ton of information stuck in the scientific community and stuck in scientific papers. And one of my jobs is to tease all that out and bring it down to an operational level. So that's where most of the statistics rely uh, are are lying right now. And they're not even, uh, you're not going to find that in any OSHA regulation or the Bureau or BLS on fatigue. However, there are stats in the in the uh, in the research community about fatigue and stats and what the injury rate would be. You see, and and that's interesting that you mentioned that because as I did research for our conversation, I started trying to pull up anything that I could find in regards of fatigue, sleep deprivation, and so on. And the only thing that I could really find that was talking about sleep deprivation per se was from the National Sleep Foundation. And then, of course, they give some some timelines on what they say, depending on your age bracket, on how many hours of sleep you should get. So, of course, when you start talking to about adults, they say that the average 18 to 64 year old should get about seven to nine hours of sleep. And then it said that if you're if you're older, between seven and eight. And so you start looking at that. And I know that you referenced the National Safety Council a couple of times, and they have a particular course where they're talking about defense of driving and on this defense of driving they talk about sleep debt and then they start saying if you don't get enough hours of sleep so let's use the seven and nine in particular here so let's say for instance last night you only slept six hours and you're supposed to normally on average sleep not seven to nine all of a sudden now you have a sleep deficit so as you they start going into the sleep deficit they start talking about now you're doing yourself as a disservice as a driver now it's talking there from a driver aspect so what exactly are you seeing in your research for instance the, the cdc does a lot NIOSH does a lot, uh, the Journal of Chronobiology does a lot, and there are other uh, uh, organizations out there that deal with fatigue and study for this. So, for instance, reading from the slide, CDC did a study in 2013 and 2014, and they looked at, at occupations. They looked at 180,000 employees, 180,000. That's, that's not a very small N, is it? Not at so, all. The point is, they looked at 180,000 employees, and what they did is, to, to make the data manageable, they categorized them using the uh, the occupational standards that the government use. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that. So they, they, they pushed them into those categories, and this is what they found. Uh, communication, comm equipment operators, 58% of them, whatever that group was, slept less than seven hours per night. Food preparation, 40%. Healthcare practitioners, 40%. Healthcare support, 40%. Uh, protective services, now we're talking about security, fire, police, emergency services, 39%. Production, 43%. The one that's most troublesome is transportation workers, which is 54%. Not only that, this study took a look at these 180,000 people, and they found out that between the ages of 30, 18, and 54, 40% of them were sleeping less than seven hours per night, which is the National Sleep Rec Foundation recommended number. And that number, so when, when, when you tell people about that number, they go, oh yeah, I've heard of eight hours of sleep per night, but they have no idea what that means. The point is, the reason why the National Sleep Foundation does that is because it's all about quality and quantity. You need both. You need quality and you need quantity. Now, everybody has a different quality and quantity. And I can ask you, Jay, how many hours of sleep? And I, I ask this in class. How many hours of sleep do you need per night versus how many hours of sleep do you get? And usually what I find, it's about a two, three hour difference. Well, I probably I, I would have to probably factor that me personally probably need need probably somewhere around the eight hours a night. And I end up on average probably somewhere between three and four. Okay, and so and see, so now now you're, you're talking. We're going to get to the complexity of all of this. That's 
that is the problem, it's the complexity, because you have a work-life balance issue in tension with one another. So for for instance, for you, let's suppose, let's not even talk about you, let's talk about a, a theoretical person, person X. Okay. They're supposed to get eight hours of sleep per night and they only get two. Over a five day period, they are 10 hours in sleep debt, 10 hours. Most fatigue scientists say that if you are 10 hours in sleep debt, your mental capacity to do work is going to be diminished. You are in sleep debt, you are fatigued. Period, doc, have a nice day. And so a lot of people don't understand that. So now the question is, what generates that? What really generates that type of feeling? Well, there's a lot of contributing factors and these things have to be teased out. So if you and I were in a class together, I would, I would show you this list that I'm gonna to mention to you and then I have you prioritize them because I don't know what you can resolve or what you can reduce. So for instance, some of the contributing factors, anything that gives you stress, emotional, mental stress, or maybe you might have a medical condition, or it might be self-induced. So for instance, you're working a full-time job, but you want to get ahead of, get ahead in life, and so you're doing a degree at night. That's self-induced. Work-induced, you're working more than, uh, than 10 hours a day, or you're working more than 50 hours a week. Or it's a lifestyle choices. I like to play in the band till one o'clock in the morning, or I like to play poker with the fellas, or I like to give charitable my time away to charitable organizations, and yet I'm not sleeping well. Or your sleep environment's not right, or you're taking medication that's not right, or preventing you from sleep. And all of these things can either work in isolation or in combination with one another to destroy or limit or reduce your sleep. And so if we were in class, I'd ask you to take a look at these and start prioritizing because now you have an opportunity to say, okay, what can I do and what can I do and what can I accomplish and what I cannot accomplish? And that's the whole idea. I mean, this is where this service becomes more personal. And I know that there are companies out there, Jay, that, that have these fancy technological devices uh, you know, you, you, you plug in your sleep before you get to work and they'll, they'll, you know, you do it like a time card kind of thing and they'll do that. But to me, it's not reaching the level to the managers. I mean, senior executives have the same problems as the person on the shop room floor. It doesn't matter. And so the point is, is that the technological thing is nice and it's shiny and it's new. But the idea is getting down to the person to try and change some lifestyle behaviors is difficult to do, but it's a needed kind of skill that needs to be put in place. So Joe, if somebody's interested in trying to implement this, how would they go about doing it? I mean, how do they all of a sudden now go into their company and say, hey, we need to change our, our issues with fatigue and sleep deprivation that we have with our particular employees? How, how would they actually implement a program as such? Well, the first thing I think is that first they have to recognize that it can be an issue in their industry or in their company. The second thing, and I've done too many of these things, is crawl, walk, run. The first thing that I, I would like for any safety person to do is take a look if they have the capability, and some of them don't, to do a data analysis on what they already have in regards. We've got a timestamp on, on a, on a, on a uh, injury that happened. So take a look at their timestamps and see if you can't find a trend there. That may not provide you all the data you need. That it may not be the best data. The second thing is, is that one, one thing you can do is, is have a survey of the employees that are there and ask them these particular questions and do it as a class and have them write down on paper how much sleep they actually get, how much sleep they need, and, and just put some of these stress factors down. They don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, tied to them. We don't want them to be singled out because the last thing I want to have happen is to have this thing weaponized. I've seen things like this happen before and that is the wrong path to take. So be that as it may, then you have to start collecting data. So it has to be part of your, your accident investigation, your incident investigation type of things. How many hours of sleep did you have? And, and, and those are standard questions that need to be asked. Also, what can be also asked is the near miss system is also a, a wonderful place and the uh, correction and pre preventative action area is also another area where you can collect information. And you're gonna have to collect information 
maybe for six months, maybe to a year at that point in time. At the same time, you could be educating your employees on these particular issues of what is. And so if you start collecting that data, you might find out exactly what's going on here and, and then move from there. And also, what I would normally do right off the bat is, that as a, just as a courtesy, I have a scientifically validated program that takes a look at shift schedules. And so we plug in the, the, the days and the hours and we look at over a 30 day period. And 30 days is more important than just one week because it shows you the trends of how much fatigue is available. And so what it does is fits out on the Y axis is the average probability of sleepiness that a person would experience. And everybody is different. So it would tell us, and I've done that for a few folks already, uh, but it hasn't shown any fruit, but I've done it for them. And some of them, I mean, I, there's one organization I'm thinking in particular that is above 50%, and, and but they're working permanent nights, and permanent nights is the worst. It is the worst schedule you could ever be on. And they're over 50%, which means the opportunity to fall asleep is 50%, right on the job. And it may be planned or it may be unplanned. So I know that sometimes they say that there are certain people that are able to sleep are able to sleep during the day and some people can work nights because of that and so on. Do you really think that a person can adjust to that or based on what you just said, not really? Okay, great question, Jay. Great, great question. Your physiology, and that's part of the class or part of the training, your physiology is set in stone. You're supposed to sleep at night and stay awake during the day. So there are, there are tools that you have, and I, I go over several tools that are practical types of things that you can uh, that you can learn and understand how to get a better sleep. And what I'm trying to do is, is not um, modify, you cannot modify your physiology to, to break it the way you want it, but you can bend it, and it can be bent. Uh, one of the things uh, is, is having a consistent sleep schedule. I mean, day in and day out. Uh, uh, sleep schedule in the sense of time for bed, time to wake up. Uh, also, uh, depending upon nights, there are certain things you can do. But the list I have in front of me is, is I talk about practical coping strategies. It, it talks about alcohol, how you use caffeine, your diet, exercise. I'm in Colorado, so I talk about marijuana. I talk about napping as a strategy. I talk about nicotine noise, good or bad, over-the-counter medicine, herbals, and then something called sleep hygiene and how you prepare your bed and yourself for sleep. And so those are the practical coping strategies that a person can employ to promote sleep or if they want to disrupt sleep, they can disrupt sleep as well. So talking about sleep disruption there for a moment, what is your feeling on these energy shots that people take to stay awake and potentially caffeine pills and so on. What is your thought process about that? I think, I, I think uh, you strategically, it's okay. I know that caffeine has half-life in the body and I, I want, I want to re- think it's about, I think it's about three and a half hours, but I'm, I wouldn't quote me on that, but I, I would use it strategically. I, I'd rather use napping then I'd rather use caffeine. And the reason why is because anything else is dependent. We, 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 as humans, we have a tendency to be dependent on things. So for instance, uh, I could tell you that the number one go-to medication for sleep is Benadryl. And the problem with Benadryl, as would be with caffeine over a period of time, is you have to take greater doses and more frequently to get the desired result. And so, I would caution somebody on using those energy drinks. Okay. Now, in a pinch, yes. Or taking a nap, yes. Or using Benadryl for sleep aid, yes. But strategic use only, not as a lifestyle or a, a developing habit pattern. Okay, so, and actually, you referenced their nap. So, I have a very odd question. I noticed as doing some of the research for this that they, I had pulled up a website and it was a place based in New York where they actually had essentially they were like pods and they called them sleep pods and you could actually go into a a location book it for x amount of time 
take a nap, they come and wake you up, and then you can go back to work. Is that something that you would recommend? They also, I had also had seen a study a while back that they they said that a lot of foreign countries do what they call siesta time, and it was something it was something similar where you had. Um, an an allocated amount of time during the day where you would take a nap at work. Is that something that you would recommend then? Uh, In my opinion, in my scientific opinion, am I doing it over years? I would say no. And the reason why is this. Naps like caffeine and Benadryl are supposed to be used strategically. So for instance, there's a, I may have mentioned on uh, podcast, there's there's a wonderful video you can use on YouTube. His name is Spudgy the Dog. And uh, you look at Spudgy the dog, and he absolutely falls asleep, and he doesn't know he's falling asleep. In fatigue, scientist sleepy terms, it's called sleep pressure. In other words, your body is telling you, I'm cutting you off. There's no more, there's no more wakefulness time for you. I'm putting you to sleep, and it's an unplanned event. When you get to that point, when you start feeling that, and that's the reason why this sleepy driving is so, uh, it's so deadly, When you get to that point, it's time to take a nap. And that's when you take your nap, strategic time to take a nap. That's when you're most tired. If you do it on a regular basis, the opportunity to destroy your regular sleeping hours at night is certainly there. And you start putting perturbations or disruptions into your normal sleep cycle. And so I would advise against it. Is it it good for some folks? Yes. You become, you become dependent upon that as anybody else. Okay. Would you say that the majority of our incidents that we might have in inside of an organization in regards of, let's say, for instance, accidents, near misses, or so on, are related to fatigue then? I would say it's a contributor. Okay. Related is another word I would use to say the term as a contributor. It certainly can be a contributor, and it needs to be explored. Again, I'm not trying to say fatigue is the only thing. Oh, no, no, no. And, 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 I, and I don't want it to be referenced like I'm trying to go that way with it. I just want to... No, no, no. I, I, know word that not. I know you're not. I know you're not. But I want to emphasize that because, you know, I'm, I'm sort of zealous about this. But the, but the point is, is that I don't want it... You know, when you, when you see every problem as nailed, the only thing you have is a hammer. <laughs> I don't want to look at that one. <laughs> So if people are interested in actually getting a hold of you and you actually being able to do, I guess, some research with them inside of their organization, are you kind of restricted into a particular area of the, in the U.S. or you will go pretty much anywhere? I'm pretty restricted right now. Uh, most of the stuff I think can be done with minimal travel and, and virtual because the, the organization I just uh, I just did something on. I've, I've, I've published in several areas. Believe it or not, you can this, you can think this is this is nuts, but I, I I published in a transportation magazine called Metro Magazine. I published in food safety. Believe it or not, hmm. <laughs> uh, I have a I have a piece out in construction business owners, which I can share with you, and those those are already published. And I've got a piece coming out in Powerline Magazine, which is a utility magazine that utility companies frequently do. And then I've got this uh, other piece coming out to this uh, other organization. So uh, what I did with them is I asked their safety. I said, I don't want specific, but give me what you can. I asked them these specific questions. And actually, the piece that I wrote for them was actually a consultant piece. It was, a, it was tucked as an article, but it was a consultant piece. I gave them a solution to their problem. So when most so when most organizations start actually jumping into this or they start looking into this and they realize that they have an issue and they say, OK, let's go ahead and do a case study. How long does it normally take to get a, enough significant data back? I do not know. <laughs> I do not know. I think I think I think the idea here is that. So so here's the idea. Uh, this is how I approach them. Uh, it's a holistic approach. The first thing I want to tell them is I'm not there to take over their safety department. I'm there to complement their safety department and hopefully lead them as, lead their safety person as a mentor. So the first thing I want to do is I want to evaluate their current work schedules to find out what they are. They're going to see if they're going to have a problem or not. We can discuss that through that scientifically validated program, which I talked about. So that's the first thing. Then I want to meet with their safety person to find out what kinds of injuries they're having in regards to you know, the severity and probability of it. And then if I can, 
we need to devise a separate risk assessment system, just like ergonomics, inside their organization. And finally, we talk about employee uh, training with regards to all training of all employees to include the senior manager. So it's it's not necessarily a case study as it is as an operational type of uh, report. I guess my I, I, I put it better that way. So it's not going to be a case study. It's not going to take eight months to a year. It's going to be pretty pretty quick. And then then the point is is that you know putting all the data together, I, I can pretty much tell them what's going on. The safety person will be the person that will give me the most information because they know the people and the culture best. Okay. So Joe, if people want to reach out to you, where can they actually get a hold of you at? Well. Um, I, I say the website is uh, probably a good place, but you've taken a look at that, and and uh, unfortunately, that that thing needs to be uh, <laughs> uh, revamped a lot. Uh, they can get a hold of me uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I, actually, LinkedIn is the best place to look at all the material we're discussing, and even more, because all the stuff that I've published is on LinkedIn, and it's readily available for them and to them if they want it. I would suggest that they, they reach me at uh, email or call me. That would be the best way. So the email is joe at humanfactorsafety.com. You know, joe at humanfactorsafety.com. Or call me directly at 719-355-6326. 719-355-6326 is the best way to do that. Okay, so Joe, what I'll actually do then is I will actually, on our website, safetyfm.com, we'll go ahead and we'll put a backlink directly into, number one, your website. We'll also um, go ahead and reference your LinkedIn, if you don't mind. Um, that way it, could, it actually can be there. Um, that way they can actually contact you. Now, I really do appreciate you actually coming on to the show today, and hopefully you did enjoy your time here at Safety FM. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen. Join the fun on social media and find us on Facebook at Safety FM.